I would now like to open the floor for questions. Um, you may write your questions in the chat box. If you have any, uh, you may do so now. I guess uh, while we wait for questions to come in, maybe I can start with the first question. Um, I would like to um, direct this question to Ms. Heng. You said that behaves like a living entity and is made up of complex ecosystems. Yes. It's a thing all plantations have been subjected to heavy mechanical interventions that have stripped soils off its nutrients only to be selectively pumped with nutrients again. After such significant changes, can microbes restore their form and function? If yes, how long will it take? Thank you. Okay, thank you for the questions. For the microbe and other bigger organisms, as long as there are enough nutrient, moisture, then they can be reproductive again, start their life cycle again. Because most of the microbes, they dormant as spore or in the form that can withstand the harsh environment. When there are nutrients and water applied to them, then they can start put back on their forms and do their metabolic activity. So for my research done, for bacteria, it only takes about two or three days, then it can be grow reproductive. For fungus, it will take about one month, uh, one week, sorry, one week for it to become a uh, mature bed and function again. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Peng. Okay, I have a question from the floor um, for Christine. Um, the first question is, was there any attempt to monitor the microorganism population in the soil? And second, what is biojuice? Where is it applied to the palm, to the oil palm, and how much per year? Um, thank you for your questions. Let me just answer the, um, the question on the microorganisms. And I'll let John, well, I can't take all the credit for the work, so I'll let John answer the other one on the biojuice. Um, so to answer your questions, yes, we have started to monitor the microorganisms. We are using nematodes or um, um, earthworms as a bioindicator of soil health. Um, we, but we've only started doing the, the, the count, the earthworm count at every of the palm that we are monitoring um, sometime in August this year. So hopefully um, we would be able to have some results to share with you. Um, maybe next year if we have this webinar again. Um, but I'll be very excited to, to, to see what, what these earthworm counts will show us. So far, we've done this work for some of the um, Sabah, sorry, the Sabah plots as well as the Johor plots, and just comparing the different kind of soils in these two different regions compared to Perak. I can already see some sort of correlation between the different types of soil types with the numbers of um, earthworms. So if you have any suggestions of any other good bioindicators other than earthworms, that will be um, much welcome. And we can always have that discussion. So, John, over to you and Biojuice. Okay, thanks, Christine. Thanks for the question. Okay, Biojuice is, is an interesting thing. Biojuice is, is what a lot of people are uh, maybe know as enzyme. Um, it's, it's really um, the making of a organic rich um, juice from organic matter uh, with, with, uh, with sugars and with rainwater. And we produce, as you saw in, I think in the slide, there is the, the bins. Um, and we produce an aerated, what we call an aerated compost tea, um, which increases the fungal and microorganism content of the biojuice uh, several thousand fold, maybe million fold. This is then applied to the palms uh, or, or to the area around the, uh, the growing circle of the palms. And we particularly apply this to uh, the, the frond stacked areas and the EFB mulching areas. And what the biojuice does, it doesn't fertilize the palm, but it creates uh, two things. It, it, it's introducing more microorganisms and fungal associations into your soil, um, but it's also feeding those associations to allow them to flourish and multiply. 
and then those associations are what um, creates this link between the, the palm roots, uh, the biorhizome, and the nutrients. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you, John. Um, I've got another question for Ms. Heng. What would you say to Dr. James that all palm is totally dependent on inorganic fertilizers? Chemical free regime is impossible. Do you have any response? Uh, thank you for questions. At this moment, we really uh, depends on the inorganic fertilizer. However, in the future, and what is uh, Air Asia we are doing is we are trying to develop and apply some organic ways to sustainable. So I think we are working on it. In the future, we can try all this possible work on it. Thank you. Uh, can I just add on something since my name is mentioned? Sure. Yeah, uh, I think you got it a bit. Uh, I may have misworded it. I did not mean that oil palm is 100% dependent on inorganic fertilizers, but it will need the input of inorganic fertilizers to meet the nutrient demand. 100% of organic fertilizers will not be possible at present time unless we have more work done on biofertilizers and also alternative sources. Using 100% organic fertilizer, sometimes, let's say you're using dungs for nitrogen, then it can lead to a disturbance in the carbon nitrogen ratio of the soil. Then again, we, have, we are into another problem. So what I meant is you cannot do it 100% at present time. It's not that it's 100% dependent on inorganic we have been using, in the industry, had been using bunch ash before as a source of potassium. But now it is so expensive and people do not want to, I mean, there are other environmental uh, impacts dealing with the burning of the, uh, of the EFB and all. Okay, that's a simple comment. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vijay. John and Christine, um, would you like to chip in as well on that question? Is it possible to be chemical free? John and Christine, any response? If not, I will move on to the next question. Sorry, uh, I was muted. Yeah, it's a good question. And I think it's really what we're trying to, um, to, to not answer today, but at least get some way down the road towards trying to answer in the next in the next five to 10 years, I guess. Um, we, we've seen the results so far um, from our bio interventions that there are potential solutions on a small scale. How that replicates upwards, we still don't really know or understand. Um, we are pretty confident uh, based upon really, um, you know, the last 150 years of global agricultural practices there are a lot of examples where bio type interventions have worked. But in the last 50 years, we've moved as a planet into this sort of chemical dependency. And what we're trying to do is look back at what was traditionally done, what worked, what didn't work, and whether we can actually get back to that is a, is a, is a moot question. But we, at Wild Asia, we have full confidence that that this is a program that we want to push ahead with in the next five to 10 years. And we want to see how we can really hopefully change the face of Malaysian agriculture. And that, that includes the big boys like Dr. Vijay and, and UP, but also primarily the, the, in the start with the smaller, the smaller players. So I, I think it can be achieved. It will take time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think I will take two to three more questions from the floor before we wrap up. Um, I think there's this one general question, but it would be good to just address it. Uh, this question is, why should monoculture be a negative aspect of agriculture, as monoculture cultivation is as old as agriculture itself? What are your views? Um, I'm opening it up to the, to the speakers, if anyone would like to address this question. I didn't quite hear the whole question, but I heard the first part, Sharin. 
Um, I think the, the importance of that, the answer to this lies in what benefits we as a, as a species, human beings get from having a vibrant and healthy biodiversity base. Um, we, we travel now through Malaysia and you're basically, a sea, you are in a sea of oil palm. Um, and I, the way I see it, oil palm farmers and plantation companies are the guardians of our nature, what nature we have left outside of Tamanagara and other state parks and national parks is really based mostly in oil palm plantations. And we have to be in a position 20, 30 years down the line where we can say we took care of our environment, our agricultural landscapes, and we created a diverse um, a, a array of habitats, uh, both for agricultural production and also for biodiversity conservation, because the, without a healthy, vibrant biodiversity, all kinds of natural systems start to collapse. And it's easy to think about tigers and tapirs and rhinoceroses, but actually the biodiversity we have in our soil is incredible. And that's a big part of what drives all these systems. Uh, not just the agricultural systems, but the natural based habitat systems too. Thanks. Thank you, John. Uh, Ms. Heng, Dr. Vijay, do you want to add anything to that? What is monoculture bad? And if it is, why? Uh, I would not say monoculture is bad. You see, the like when we talk about sustainability of environment, you got to think of three things people, planet, and profit. Agriculture has been one of the major, or plantation crops has been one of the major drivers for the country's economy. And if you do agriculture the correct way, or what we call by good agriculture practices, then monocrop is not something which is negative as being perceived by many people. You see, the, many do not understand the oil palm industry. Though it's a monocrop, there are many other living things under the oil palm canopy. And we have been, whatever practices that I've showed you just now on my slides have been practiced by the industry since almost for a hundred years. For example, EFB mulching in United Plantations started before World War I. So this is something that the industry is practicing, but what is there is the lack of data. How much did the soil improve in the hundred years? What was it at the start and what is it now? So these kind of things, it's, uh, there, there are many questions to be answered. To me, I would say it's always striking a balance between ecology, people, and, and the crop itself. So monocrop, it's not something negative because we have a perception that we will do blanket spraying and all. It is not being practiced anymore. We only spray the circle. We keep a lot of soft vegetations in the non-harvesters part. And then we are going for, and even fertilizers, all palm is never over fertilized because 60% of your production cost in the field is your fertilizer. So nobody will over fertilize. They will go, they will give what the palm needs. But the question now is how do you determine what the palm needs? So that is what the big boys or the plantation industry, the planters are passing on to the smallholders. Like in United Plantations, we conduct smallholder field day and we share the practices that we do with the smallholders. And the steam is done by my colleagues in Sime Darby, KLK, IOI, so on and so forth. So I think that is the perception that has to be changed on palm, oil palm industry in general. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, Dr. Vijay. Um, I will pick my last question since we are um, almost running out of time. And I think this question is uh, pretty good as a follow up to the previous question. And that is, what are the current practices or methods in the social aspect of convincing farmers to shift to a more sustainable chemical free method? What, what is needed um, to shift mindsets of smallholders? I am opening it up to the floor as well, either John or uh, Dr. Vijay to answer because you're working more with smallholders. Okay, let me let me try first. Um, I, I think something that that is very relevant to every smallholder is is profit. Um, they first and foremost want to feed their families. They want to 
uh, improve their economic situation. So unless, unless we can show that a movement towards organics or bio interventions or, or less chemical dependency um, has a benefit in the wallet, uh, it's not going to happen. So I think this is number one. Um, I think what we are lucky with the Wild Asia is we have the, the WAGS program and it's built on a very strong relationship with, with groups of smallholders. We've seen them through a process of RSPO certification. We've shown over the years that we are a reliable partner. Um, we have a strong technical base. We are, we are willing and able to provide them with technical assistance. This provides confidence, this provides uh, interest. And we've seen within our WAGS program then num numbers of members who are keen to come forward and say, I want to give this a go. So, so having, that, having that ability or that keenness to start is, num is very important. And once they see that the profits are not damaged and that they can make more money from it, then they're keen to carry on. We'll see where it takes us. Um, but I think, I think number one is look after their, their welfare. Thank you, John. Dr. Vijay, do you have anything else to add? Uh, oh, do you want okay, me to? What I, yeah, yes. Yeah. Please, can you? Uh, basically, the question is about how do we change mindset of smallholders so that they would uh, be more um, sustainable or practice chemical free farming? Okay. Uh, I, I will not talk much about chemical free farming. And I'm not an advocate for chemical companies or chemical usage, but what the smallholder needs, like what John says, they need to see first whether they could put food for their family. I mean, they need to make a profit through farming. So what are the practices they do? They, I mean, between hunger and sustained environment, between hunger and environment, they will always go to feed the hunger first. So unless they see the profit in doing the sustainable practices or the organic practices, they may not go into it. And what of the, the saddest part with the smallholders, they are short of information on all palm cultivation or even coconuts. They are in need of information. So that is where the industry has been doing its best to educate the, uh, the smallholders on the various good agriculture practices. So it takes some time for them. And, uh, but over, I'm sure after some time, they will reach towards it. It is not about raising the ceiling of the big plantation, but it's also about raising the floor where the smallholders yields are there. You have to reach a sustainable yield and then they will see the benefits of it. All right, I hope I answered that question. Okay, thank you very much to all our speakers for answering the questions. Um, Christine is actually engaging uh, all the other questions on the chat, chat box. Um, hope that is sufficient. If you have any other questions, feel free to reach out to us, um, either Waldasia or Utah, um, and we will try to take this offline and answer any other questions that you may have. So now I would like to invite each speaker to give a short one to two minutes closing remark. Let's start with Ms. Heng. Okay, thank you for the, all the presenting. Uh, in closing remark, I feel that as long as we provide, have a good environment for all the organisms to live on, the nutrient cycling, all the functions can be going on. And it takes time okay, because living organism. Okay? We hope we can go for not 100% chemical. We also have, have a mixture of it. Thank you. John, would you like to go next? Sure. <clears throat> so I, I would like to um, firstly thank everybody uh, for organizing this seminar. I think it's been very, very useful and very interesting. Uh, Utah in particular for hosting us um, and creating the level of interest they've managed to create. Uh, I think more than 125 participants is quite phenomenal. Um, 
all the speakers, I think, very interesting ideas. There's a, you know, there's a lot of different ideas out there, um, and how we can sort of bring it together is going to be important over the years. Um, I think what's really important is is this underpinning idea that if we look after our soils, we will look after ourselves and our planet. Um, and the more we look at soils, not just from the microorganism and, and biological side of things, we're looking at the importance of soils for, for carbon sequestration and, and possibly, you know, a really good opportunity to solve some of the major climate emergency uh, questions being asked, and which we don't have much, much time to, to answer as a, as a planet. So I would say soil is, is you know, really interesting get down, get dirty, get interested in soils. And we need a lot of Malaysian, especially Malaysian researchers and young people to get interested in soils and to move this whole uh, organic based farming and chemical less farming uh, forward. So thank you all very much. And, and, and from Wild Asia's perspective, I think we are, you know, Christine's monitoring the, the chats coming in and the questions, we'll try to get back to everybody. Um, if there's a particular question we can answer. So thanks a lot. Dr. Vijay? Okay, uh, first of all, I would like to thank Wild Asia and Utah for the invitation. So to share some of what we are doing here. And talking about uh, sustainable agriculture, it is about striking a balance between the people, planet and profit. Again, I'm, I'm repeating what I said earlier. And uh, we could achieve this at present time by mixing organic and inorganic farming together. There are many practices that is practiced by the plantations which are in sync with the environment, which we could push it down, bring to the small holders and become sustainability. End of the day, I would just like to add what like John says, know your soils and the answers to your crop will be there and love your soil, soil is life. Thank you. Thank you to all speakers. Perhaps if I may recap the key points today are soil is an ecosystem in itself with various life and they are interconnected. So by taking care of the health of the soil, we would be able to improve the health of the trees. Monoculture reduces biodiversity above and below ground. There are still different interpretations between the conventional plantation methods um, and the more experimental smallholder. Um, do we strike a balance? Do we go fully chemical or do we go fully chemical free? That is an ongoing discussion. For smallholders current practices, they result in loss of nutrients as shown by the presentations, presentation by Wild Asia. Perhaps this is an opportunity to engage with smallholders to improve their practices. And to do this is to have continuous engagement with smallholders, building relationships on the ground. Now with that, thank you everyone for your time attending this session. I hope you found it insightful and beneficial for your own work or if you're a student for your studies.